My name is Sabina O'Hara, and I currently serve as the founding dean of the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Sciences at the University of the District of Columbia, the only public uh, in the nation's capital of the United States and the only exclusively urban land-grant university in the country of the United States. And my colleague, Tom Kokovic, who Unfortunately, he just left me. He, is the, he has the luxury of being retired since May, and he keeps rubbing it in. Um, so he now has Feels time good. for all that for all that research. And he is a physicist by training, and was in our environmental science department until recently. Um, we want to do um, uh, three things this afternoon with you um, that are probably a, a, a bit radical. Number one, um, we want to introduce you to a model that we came up with that actually models GDP as a function of physical processes in nature. Uh, number two, uh, after I introduce the model, uh, Tom will walk you through the math because that's over my head. And number three, I want to review with you some of our modeling results, okay? So what's the background to all of this? Some of you may know that for the last 20 years or so, um, I have um, been working with a model that I call sort of the sustaining production function. And it basically suggests that there is more to economic production than just that conversion of inputs into outputs that we normally look at. But there are a lot of things that are going on simultaneously, um, emissions and waste, and of course, absorptive capacity, these nasty sink capacities that keep um, throwing sort of a monkey wrench into the whole process. You mentioned um, earlier, right, uh, it's, it's sort of a toss-up. Are we going to run out of oil first? or um, are we going to ruin the globe first in terms of the absorptive capacity? So point is, everything takes place within a biophysical context. And these context systems, of course, have certain rules and behaviors. And the economy as a subsystem would do well to understand a bit about these um, behaviors. Um, I draw a lot of my work uh, on Georgesco Rugen's work. And what I find particularly interesting about his work is that he makes a distinction between um, inputs and, and, and output flows and processes. And I'm not going to do justice to, uh, by, by sort of paraphrasing uh, him, uh, but one of the uh, production papers that he uh, wrote, he says, well, um, it's, it's kind of curious that we've been so focused on the flows of stocks and we pay so little attention to the funds and services, namely that which processes, processes these flows of energy and material. And so in our model, we want to look both, namely at the material and energy flows that cross the boundaries between physical, biological systems and the economic system and the processes that occur within that boundary and outside of that boundary. So with that, we said, so what is one of the most important things? We all know about the importance of energy, and that's not new in ecological economics. But what is it about energy that's so terribly important. A lot of planets have energy. Turns out our planet does something unique with that energy, namely it uses it in a hydrological cycle. And without that water, nothing else happens. We had a fabulous opening event last night where you know the air, the water, the soil slash food production were emphasized. And that's very much what our work is about in urban agriculture and urban sustainability, too. And so we said, let's look at this hydrological cycle upon which all material conversion and ultimately all life depends. Um, and then let's look at how that freshwater cycle is allocated to three key uses, agriculture, domestic use, and um, industry. So. By calculating the amount of available energy that comes in through the sun, that's the, the potential available energy for evaporation, and the allocation of water to these key uses, 
we were actually able to predict the GDP for five countries. And we picked some interesting ones because they make up about 60% of GDP globally. China, Germany, India, Russia, and the United States. And our analysis shows some very interesting critical relationship between a country's economic potential and freshwater use and the fundamental representation of the physical processes that form these context systems within which economic activity takes place. This is just to show you sort of what water consumption looks like globally. Um, and you got here in um, red, Australia and uh, New Zealand, the world summary is that blue line at the top. North America is that pink and of course fast growing Asia, that's that dark line in the center. Um, this is what water allocation use looks like in China right now. You see a steep, steep increase in water use in industry and a steady decline in water use for agriculture. And of course, then there is the domestic water use that's at the blue line at the bottom. Um, okay, Tom, I think I'm going to turn it over to you at this Good. point. Basically, what we're doing here, we're going back to the basics. You only have one input on this planet. Last night, I heard blue dot, I used to call it the dot. When you're 93 mile, million mile away, and the sun, planet Earth looks that big. The only thing that you receive is that solar radiation. That's it. That is your energy. And the only input through the boundary of Earth is just that. Then you have a s system which now you have to transform that energy into some means of processes. Earth has it. We have what we call hydrological cycle. The moon, which is next door to us, doesn't definitely, Mars doesn't. We have that. So you have this continuity of the two edges of the sword playing together. And then what you do have, you have that solar energy, which is embedded now in your water vapor. And it is hydrologically distributed all over the planet. And your nations pick it up and allocate for industry, domestic, or agriculture. They do that. The data we obtained was from United Nations and All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Should I start all over or not? No. No. So what, what we have now is that the, the value that is given to the energy is we have calculated actually the sun evaporates water vapor. One gallon of water vapor evaporation on Earth requires 10 kilowatt hour. And I have changed the distance between sun and Earth by a million miles and I have changed even the rainfall and still is about 10 kilowatt hour. This is an incredible situation that we're having. That value then is given some dollar value and then if you multiply it, you come up with a GDP. It's a little bit more complex than that, but I don't want to bother you with too much of mathematical equations. But I'm telling you, it's basically one thing and one thing alone. is the solar energy transformation into water vapor. And uh, trouble here with the slides. Don't know what happened. Who's high-tech in here? <laughs> uh, yeah. OK. Go back to the, yeah, OK. Is that one? All right. But just quickly, it's just I'm trying to give you an understanding of what we call solar constant. Solar constant on Earth is basically calculated everywhere around equatorial areas, about 1,390 watt or thereabout. And it is function of temperature of the solar surface. As you see, it's all physical. The radius of the sun and the distance sun-earth squared. 
and the power is basically the surface area of the Earth and then divided by the rainfall. We go to the next, please. And here we're showing basically the three-dimensional graphs that you do see that there's always 10 kilowatt hour thereabout, no matter what you do. To evaporate one gallon of water on planet Earth, it costs 10 kilowatt hour. Notice I didn't say dollars, I said kilowatt hour. That's what we deal with. And uh, God forbid this equation. And uh, uh, there is an equation for GDP, believe it or not, function of some, a lot of physical parameter, and of course, other things. And we don't want to really go through that. I just want to go to the next pages. And, uh, but I'll show you the pictures, the graphs will, will give you some idea. Uh, uh, not at this time. All right. These are the various. These, these are the, okay. What I, I heard a lot about people saying growth and limitation to growth. Well, the mathematic is not my cousin. It could be actually my enemy. What we do when you do mathematics, it will tell you exactly what you feel or not feel. And what we see here, there is a growth. You see that? I call it landscape. Uh, no. Go back to my, no, 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 my, my graphs. Just the graph. Oh, the, the cost. Yeah, no, more. Graph. The, 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 the lands. Yeah, okay, stay right there. You, you, you notice, like this is for Germany. Well, there is your growth. Germany could grow up to uh, $15 trillion, period. Right now it's $3 trillion. Okay, and it's funny that, why? Because the two parameters that are very important here, obviously domestic allocation is domestic given, and I'm taking these values by, as nations give those values there. But you notice two parameters. One is how much industrial, what percent industrial, and what percent agriculture. Germany is already so efficient, and agriculture is ridiculous. It uses 1%, which is incredible, versus India, 81%. You're going to see that graph. So. Once it's stuck in there, Germany only has one way to grow. How efficient can you be in basically moving water toward agriculture? I'm talking about efficiency. In other words, saving water. And the only way Germany could grow, and then I have calculated three positions. One, where it is, where it could be, or where it could slide down. And uh, you see, Germany could only increase its GDP if it reduces its agriculture, its uh, industrial use. It's all the way to 80%, we have to go down lower. You see, if you go toward 20%, you see a cusp. That is your growth. That is exactly maximum growth that you have. You want to say something? So. Yeah. We're told by the chair that we have to wrap this up, but we've got calculations for all uh, five of the countries. First thing we did, we used the parameters um, to um, actually calculate the GDP and verify that the model can do that. We did some sensitivity analysis um, to vary gener uh, energy cost. Um, as well as population size to see how the model responds to that. Um, let me summarize the upshot here. Um, growth potential is absolutely dependent on the opposite that we as economists tend to think. We tend to assign value to resources when they are used, when they cross the boundary from the physical context to the economy and are getting transformed. What our model shows is that the opposite is true, namely savings in water are key to economic growth. The countries with the highest water entropy, unused water, are those with the highest potential. Now, that means that theoretically there is pretty big potential for China and in India, for example, provided that they get out of water use in agriculture, reallocated to industry, but in doing so, they have to achieve 
significant increases in water entropy, that is in saved water rather than in utilized water. Um, we could show you a whole bunch of other results in terms of the impact of population as well as energy costs, but we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.